You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Welcome back to the Muster Masterclass. It's awesome to have all of you here in the classroom, and it's awesome to have all of you online. And to all of our listeners on the podcast, welcome to the Muster Masterclass. Good evening, everyone. So I apologize for last week. I wasn't here, but I had my brother, who is more than worthy of filling in my place. He is an exceptional teacher. He's an exceptional master, scholar, an author, and just really, really fabulous and a great privilege and honor that he agreed to cover my class last week. But I feel like I missed out because I missed all y'all. I missed being here. I missed teaching this class. I missed this platform of being able to share the incredible words of Torah that I had prepared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the little bite. And if you were here last week in the Tuesday class and the Friday class, I shared this, but this will lead right into tonight's topic. We know there is a special mitzvah in the Torah to believe in God. Anochi Hashem Elokecha, the first of the Ten Commandments, is that I am Hashem, your God. This is something that we need to ingrain into our consciousness and our subconsciousness every single day to recognize and live with that clarity that God is right in front of us. Now, I've said for years in this class that there's no commandment in the Torah to believe in God. There is a different commandment which people confuse. You see, in Christianity and other religions, they have this idea of uh, taking a leap of faith, meaning I don't know if it's true or not true, but I'm going to take a leap of faith. In Judaism, that's not the case. In Judaism, we have to have clear knowledge of Hashem. Knowledge is different than belief. Knowledge, I know. It's very clear. It's concrete. I believe we're having faith as well. I'm not going to ask too many questions. I'm not, I don't want to put doubts. I'm just taking a leap of faith, and I hope it's true. And if it's wrong, then okay, well, you know. So I want to change a little bit of what I've said in the, in, in the past, in that, yes, we do need to get to a point where our belief in Hashem is clear, crystal clear knowledge. And our sages tell us that we need to constantly re- affirm the knowledge of Hashem's presence in our daily lives. How do we do that? We do that by recognizing all the goodness that Hashem does for us. When we recognize every morning with the blessings that we say every day, we say the blessing of Pokeach Evrim, Hashem opens our eyes and gives us the ability to see. Malbisha Rumi, Hashem gets us dressed every day, gives us the, right, we're able to stand upright. I mean, all of the incredible gifts that are, Every one of those needs to reaffirm our knowledge of Hashem. And when we're in a situation that we see that clarity, we need to reaffirm it. Because that brings that knowledge and makes it solid in our consciousness. So that at every moment of our lives, we're living with the knowledge of Hashem. Not maybe one day I'll believe. We need to invest in it. We need to invest time. We need to invest research. We need to invest uh, um, efforts into that knowledge and having clarity of Hashem's existence. There's a, a student of ours, a torch. I'm not going to mention his name, but he was on a quest. He was a, a, a uh, self-declared atheist and decided that you can't be an atheist without investigating. Right? An atheist, you have knowledge that there's no God. And so he has to at least investigate that. So he did a mad, he said every waking moment of the day that he wasn't working, he was on his computer doing research on proofs of God. Is there God? Isn't there God? After six months of doing intense research, he concluded there's a God. And then that led him to the next question. If there's a God, then what does he want from me? What's the big picture here? Why am I here in this world? What's my purpose? And that led him to a Torah lifestyle. But it was his own investigation. And I, the, the point that I want to get at is that each and every one of us, let's start with a clean sheet of paper. Let's assume that we know nothing. and We have no rabbis who's ever told us about God or belief. 
how am I going to internalize for myself that knowledge of God, not belief, that maybe, maybe there is, I think there is, I, I, I'm sure there is, but no, 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 knowledge, investing in it, investigating it. Every moment of our life should be filled with that knowledge of Hashem's existence. So I want to share with you what the gem, the pearl that I was going to share with you last week, and then we're going to go into this week's topic. And that is, we say, Lahagid in, in chapter 92 in Psalms, Lahagid baboker chazdecha ve'emunatcha balilot, to sing your praise in the mornings and your faith at night. So this is so beautiful, this verse. So beautiful. What does that mean? To sing your praise in the morning and to have faith at night. So it's, it's, it's magnificent. Listen to this beautiful idea. Morning means clarity. Morning means clarity. It's daytime. It's light. We can see things. It's clarity. Nighttime is confusion. Nighttime is when we don't have clarity. Our sages tell us the way our life needs to be is that when we have clarity, when we see the hand of Hashem, we need to sing His praise and sing His praise and sing His praise. Because there will come a time where we're going to have confusion. We're going to have time where it's going to be difficult, where it's not going to be so obvious that Hashem is right there. So during the daytime is when we put that rainy day fund, we put money, we put, not money, but we put our our knowledge of Hashem into a fund. So you put it, pack it in, pack it in. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. I'm, I got those bracelets. Don't worry. I'm going to be sending them out right away. Right? The thank you, Hashem. Reminding yourself every single day. Reminding yourself again and again and again. Reaffirming it when it's clear. Because there might come a time where, God forbid, you lose your job. Or a crisis happens. Or, God forbid, there's an illness. And then we're like, where's God? Then you'll have to pull out those reserves. You'll have to pull out those savings. And at that point, it may not be knowledge. It might be just faith. You know, we've had an, an, an abundance of, of blessing in all of those days where we had clarity. Now when it's a little nighttime, you need to sometimes pull that reserve that you put aside in the past. And I think that it's a very important idea is to always be building your savings account. Be building your savings account of emunah, of, of knowledge of Hashem. So that when we do have a moment of weakness, it's easy for us to draw from our reserves. And we, we don't question our, our faith in Hashem. We may not understand why. We may not understand the, the, the reasons behind why Hashem does certain things. But at least it won't question, it won't shake our very foundation of our knowledge of Hashem. There's nothing wrong, by the way, just so that you know, in, in, you know, I was once uh, co-officiating, I've said this story before, but I was co-officiating with a, uh, a Catholic uh, minister. Uh, he had a very big congregation of 8,000 members, and we were doing a, the invocation for the Holocaust Museum dinner here in Houston. Uh, so they wanted a rabbi and they wanted a, a priest, and uh, it's the beginning of a joke, you know, as the rabbi and a priest... Uh, the, you know, walk into a bar, right? So, so no, so we, 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 so we, before we, before we did this officiation, because there were like 1,200 people there, it's a very, uh, you know, high profile event. And so they wanted us to meet in advance and to coordinate exactly what I was going to say, what he was going to say. We're going to prepare all our remarks, you know, in that invocation. So we decided we're going to stay away from all reference to the name of our God. We're just going to say God is very, very innocuous and very not, you know, neutral. But we got into a conversation. We were meeting at Starbucks and we were schmoozing and, you know, what do you do? So I told him, I, you know, we, I run an organization called Torch and we do Jewish education. So, uh, so what do you do? He says, well, we have a big congregation. We have over 8,000 members and it's like a big operation. They have many, many, many uh, pastors and it's like, it's busy. So I said, he asked me, what do you teach? So I said, actually, right now, I'm in the middle of doing a, uh, a question and answer series. I told him, we teach in all these different congregations around town. We do question and answers. So I, I, I forgot for a moment who I was speaking to. So I said, you know, do you ever do a question and answer series? And he stops and he looks at me. He says, you forgot my religion. He says, in my religion, there are no questions. 
right? You, you take it as a leap of faith. This is the way it is. I said, wow, in Judaism, we wouldn't survive a day like that, right? In Judaism, we all, we're always about questions. You open up a page of Talmud, and there are hundreds of questions. On every line is another question. Why? Because we're investigating for truth. We want to know, is this authentic? If it is authentic, prove it. Show me the, the proof of it. I want to see the verse in, you know, page, number, everything. I want to see exactly in detail your source because there's nothing that's told. And one of the important things that we talk about here in every single one of our classes is that there's not an extra letter, not an extra word, not an extra verse in the Torah. There's not either an extra person. We're all about questions. So I want you to know something. If you have a question about your faith, if you have a question about belief in God, don't hold it to yourself. Ask. Reach out to me. Reach out to Rabbi Yaakov. Reach out to your local bona fide rabbi. Find someone who's knowledgeable and seek out their, count, their counsel. Investigate. It shouldn't, we're not, we don't have this concept of leap of faith. You have a question, ask it. Because every question is an important question. It's very important. And if I don't know, my, you know already. If I don't know, I will tell you I won't know. I don't know. Right? That's, my, that's our agreement. We have an agreement here. Right? You ask a question. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. Okay. So, imuna, our knowledge of Hashem is the source of every single trait. When we talk about mida development, character development, what we need to have as the backbone is emuna is knowledge of Hashem. Because what's the purpose? As the introduction that we said all the way in the beginning, seven weeks ago, the purpose of our existence on this planet Earth is to emulate God. In what way? In every way. We are here to emulate God. So when Hashem has a characteristic, we want that characteristic. We need to understand. But it's that, that's not the only aspect of emuna. Emunah means faith in Hashem, knowledge of Hashem. We have to see that when we talk about this trait of generosity, of nidivut, which is generosity, which is our trait tonight, and it's very interesting, it coincides with this week's Torah portion. So beautifully. This was not pre-planned. I was just, I'm going through the traits of the, the list that we gave out at the beginning of this course. And this is the trait that falls in this week. We talk about generosity. This week's Torah portion talks all about generosity. It's the most re remarkable thing. Which is, by the way, a very good sign. Our sages tell us that when you study two things and they coincide at the same time, it's a very big sign from heaven that God loves what you're learning. And here we read the Torah portion. It talks about generosity. And we come to the Musa Master class, and we're talking about generosity. So, what is this trait of generosity? Okay, so we have to establish the following. The premise. There are two types of people in this world. There are givers, and there are takers. In this world, there are givers, and there are takers. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with a taker. Everybody wants to be in a relationship with a giver. Right? The nature of a, uh, a, a my child, my daughter, it's the most amazing thing. She's a nurturer. She wants to give and give and give, and her dolls can't get enough of her. <laughs> and she's busy all day with her dolls, you know, telling them stories and 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 reading them. The, you know, she she imagines in her mind that she is her teacher. And she does her teaching to her students. So what her teacher does, she does. And because her teacher reads mitzvah notes and they ask the children, you know, when they do a mitzvah at home, their parents should write them a mitzvah note. That's my chore every morning when I'm packing my daughter's lunch bag is to write her a mitzvah note. And uh, it's really delightful to see what she has on her mind or what she thinks is the mitzvah she did the day before or that morning. Uh, it really is, is exceptional. But this today... I was walking by and I saw my daughter sitting on the floor playing with her dolls and she's reading the dolls mitzvah notes out loud. She's like has this imaginary mitzvah note. But she, it's all about being a nurturer. That's the, that's, that's the nature. The nature of mothers are to be nurturers, are to be givers. 
the nature of every person is different. Some people are more giving and some people are less giving. The, it, what's interesting is that people have a very, very weird relationship with money. You know, if someone knocked on your door and said, please, and, and if the person looked like they were uh, a reasonable person, not someone who might be dangerous, or but someone knocks on your door and says, you know, I- I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Do you have something I can eat? Is there anybody here who wouldn't say, please, come inside. I'll give you something to eat. Well, hopefully, again, if you know they're safe, a person comes, I'll tell you, I've had many people over the years knock on my door for charity and I always invite them in. I always sit down with them. I'll always schmooze with them, talk to them, hear what their challenges are, hear what's going on in their life. And then whenever I can give them financially, I'll give them financially. I remember there was a group of guys who knocked on my door. Uh, they, were, they were Russians uh, collecting. This one was collecting for a Russian a synagogue in Moscow. And this one was collecting for a yeshiva in Moscow. And this one was collecting for a kolel. Uh, in, in Moscow, they're, they're a whole group and they were traveling around the United States collecting their respective institutions. So I remember it was just like, I, I think it was a Sunday night or a Monday night, they came in. I think I mentioned this story previously and uh, here on this Muster Master class, you know, they're standing by the door. I called them. I said, come inside. And then I realized that something didn't, didn't seem right. I'm like, when was the last time you guys ate? And they couldn't remember the last time they ate. I said, come inside. I said, come, come into the kitchen. And I, I, I took whatever we had in our refrigerator, put it on the table, and these guys devoured it. They were so hungry. I felt terrible, but I was so happy that I was able to feed them. But I, I once heard a lecture from a rabbi. He says, it's the most amazing thing. If someone knocks on your door and asks you for food, you'll give them whatever food you have. You'll give them, you know, here, take a yogurt and take it. Here's a salami for the way, and here's a this. You know, just like enjoy, right? But if someone asked us for money of the equal or less value, we may have a difficult time giving them that in money. God forbid, not, not, they're not going to spend it on, on, on bad things. Right? They'll spend it on, on food. But still, we, we have some, some difficulty with getting, getting a, a, a separation with, with, uh, with money. So there's two ways of giving. There's two ways of giving. I'm assume, assuming that we're all givers and not takers. We're all givers. We give to our synagogues and we give to our institutions and we give to, to our, our JCCs and our federations and, of course, to, of course, the torch, right? So I'm assuming that we're all givers. Do you want a giver giving to your institution for your cause that's going to give out of like, okay, here, here you go. Just, just take it. Just take it. Go. Or someone who gives graciously, someone who gives happily, someone who wants to give who's excited to give. So it's not only in the fact that you're giving, it's the way in which you're giving. So when we talk about generosity, it's not about the dollars you're giving. I remember a student of mine once told me, he says, Rabbi, when people knock on my door, I just take how much money I'm willing to give them, the $20, I open up the door, I throw it out the door, and close the door. I'm not kidding. The guy told me this is the way he did it. I said, why do you do that? See, he said, oh, it's very simple. He says, these guys are coming and they're traveling around. They don't have time to sit and schmooze with me. I'm only giving them 10 bucks or 20 bucks anyway. So why waste their time? Take your 20 bucks and go. I said, yeah, but that's not human. There's a human element in it, which is not only the dollars and cents. There's a part which is the smile that you give. There's a part which is the love that you display which is far greater and does so much more to heal someone's situation, to, to, to make someone feel loved, is part of being generous. Being generous is not about the dollars and cents. It's about the heart that goes with it. So there's an amazing thing. Everybody knows about tithing. Now, people think Christians brought this to the world. It's not true, okay? It's not true. This is, right, you pass the plate around. No, 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 no. It's all started in Judaism. Let me tell you the verse in the Torah. It says, Aser ta aser. Tithe, you shall tithe. That means anyone who earns $10, you give $1 to charity. You give $1, that's... Now, I'm going to tell you an amazing story. I'll show it to you in the Talmud. Magnificent story. The Talmud in Tractate Ta'anit 9a says the following story. Talmud says there was a man who earned every year a thousand, uh, um, a thousand, let's call it acres of crops. 
a thousand acres of crops. And every year he meticulously gave a hundred of those acres to charity. He earned a thousand, he gave 10%. He was cautious every year. 10%, boom, he gave it away. Every single year he was cautious and careful about this. He started getting old. He brings his son into the business and he tells his son, listen to me carefully. Every year without fail, I gave a tithe. And every year without fail, I got my thousand crops. He says, you're going to one day inherit my field. Don't give less than 10%. Don't give less than 10%. Because if you give less than 10%, you may not earn the full thousand crops. So eventually the father passed away and the son gave the 10% and he got the the 1,000 crops. And the next year he gave the 10% again and he got the 1,000 crops. And then he decided he's going to be a chacham. He's going to be a wise guy. And what's he going to do? He's going to say, you know what? Why am I giving 10% and I'm, I'm losing out on 10%? I'm only going to give 1%. I'm only going to give 1%. So he gave, instead of 100 crops, he gave 10 crops. And the next year, he only got 100 crops. You gave 10% of 100, so that's what you're going to get. If he would have continued to give, and the Talmud says it's so powerful. It's so powerful that when we show, so our sages tell us an amazing thing, that really God would have given us 900 crops. But he says, I'm going to give you an extra 10 because I want you to disperse it for me. I want you to show that you're a loyal messenger and I can give you that extra 10% and you distribute it for me. When you start thinking that that 10% is yours, uh, 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 that's when I pull back. That's when I take away and then you don't get it. Very powerful. But then there's something which is more than that. Our sages promise Our sages promise that anyone who gives 10%, you're allowed to test God on this. Talmud says you're allowed to test God. The verse specifically says that you're never allowed to test God. Talmud says this is one exception. One exception. You're allowed to test God with regard to tithing. An individual called me up one year and he says to me, Rabbi, I want to make a pledge to Torch. He makes a very large pledge to Torch. And he said, I want you to know this is well beyond my means. This is well beyond what I can do as a tithe. But I'm going to do it because I want God to give me 90% more. Meaning, I'm going to give you, and I know people who do this. I know a guy who he decides how much money he wants to make that year. And that's how much he gives a tithe. Meaning, He says, I want to make a million dollars this year. See, he commits to $100,000 of charity, and then God has to give him the the million so that he can be able to give that tithe for that amount. He says, I decide how much I want to make, and by that, the first day of the year, he starts writing out checks. He starts writing out checks to fill the amount so that God will have to increase the amount that he earns so that he can get his 10% that he can give, that it could be the proper 10%. It's an unbelievable way of thinking. So what's the problem? Why do people have a difficulty with tithes? Why do people have a difficulty saying, you know, 10%, I made a million dollars. Let me give $100,000, goodbye. And we see people, people have a very big difficulty with that. Why is it? Because people are afraid. You see, we grew up, our whole lives, we heard of something called financial security. You know what financial security means? You know what financial security means? Financial security means I don't trust Hashem. I have to trust myself and my own bank account. And I don't want to rely on Hashem. Because Hashem doesn't know what he's doing. Because Hashem can't figure it out. Because Hashem can't pay my surprise medical bills. What's going to be? Right? I want to be self-sufficient. So what that causes, and this is a big problem, is that causes in our mind eventually 
is that we feel that if I give, I may not have that financial security. And I don't want to be in the hands of Hashem. I don't want to rely on Hashem for that 10% that I just, quote, lost and gave away to charity. And he's going to replenish my 10%. I don't know. I don't want to be in Hashem's hands. I have financial security. I want to be in my own hands. Very dangerous. I, I think Hashem's hands are much more capable than our own. But there's something which is called ma'aser, which is the tithe. And then there's something called charity. Charity is what we give above the 10%. When we give above that. I want to tell you an amazing story. I've said this story before, and I have the book I have the book of this individual here in, in our magnificent torch library. Where is it? I don't know where the book is. The book is someplace here in our in our library. But there's an individual who came to my house, and it's an amazing story. He came to our house, and he says, uh, uh, someone called me and said, this rabbi is coming to town. Can he stay by you for Shabbos? I said, sure, he comes before Shabbos. And he looked like a typical rabbi who goes, you know, from city to city collecting money, you know, for his, uh, his institution in Israel. I see, you know, we have many people like that coming coming in, in, in our communities. So I didn't, I didn't approach this topic at all throughout the entire Shabbos. I didn't, you know, we just had a great time together schmoozing. I was telling him about what we do at Torch, and he was getting very excited. He came to our Shabbos morning class, our prayer class. And then after Shabbos, after we made Havdalah, I, I called him into my office, and I pulled out my checkbook with my pen, and I said, I said, tell me, for what's the institution that you're collecting for? See, he looks at me. Oh, he says, I'm not collecting for anybody. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, what did you come here for? I, I thought he was, like, to me, it, it seemed like he was for sure coming to collect charity. That's why he's here. So he says, I want you to call your wife and your children. I want you to sit around the table here, and I want to tell you the following story. He said when he got married, and he was a, he's a scribe. He writes Sefer Torahs. He writes uh, mezuzahs and tefillin, and a very gifted scribe as well. Very gifted scribe. So the biggest problem that a scribe has is his drawer. Once you start having you start having scrolls in the drawer, you heard the story before? Have I said this? Okay, okay. So right? So as soon as you have you have the, the scrolls piling up in your drawer, it becomes a problem. Because you keep on writing now, you gotta distribute them, you gotta get them out to the market, you gotta sell them. It, it, it becomes he had his drawer was jam packed with scrolls. He had no, no way to sell it, no way to sell it. Either way, he goes to the rabbi who's very, very poor, him and his wife, and he had a baby, and his wife was pregnant with their second child and lived in Jerusalem. And here's this American-born, uh, uh, fresh to Judaism rabbi. You know, he just, you know, he got inspired. He went to Israel on one of those trips, went, stayed in yeshiva, became religious, got married, and now he lives in Israel, and he doesn't have a way to support himself. He's a scribe. So he goes to his rabbi and he says to his rabbi, Rabbi, I need you to allow me to not give a tithe anymore. I am so poor. I can't afford any food for my own child, my wife and child. Can you please remove this requirement for me to give a tithe? So the rabbi says, listen, this is, you need broader shoulders than mine. I want you to go to this great rabbi, Rabbi Scheinberg in Jerusalem, I want you to talk to him, and perhaps he can remove that uh, that requirement for you to give a tithe. So he goes to the great Rabbi Scheinberg, and Rabbi Scheinberg says, listens to his whole story. He says to him, here's what I'll do. He says, I'm going to tell you that you don't need to give a tithe, but rather you have to give 20%. <laughs> he says, and I want you to promise me that you're going to give 20%, and I'm going to give you a blessing. My blessing is that you will have such incredible bounty, you're going to have such incredible success that you're not going to know what to do with all of your success. He came to get rid of 10%. Instead, he has to give 20%. He's like, he says, fine, I'll talk to my wife. So he goes to his wife. He says, listen, this is what the great rabbi said. 
<laughs> what do I do? So the wife says, are you crazy? She says, we don't, 10% of nothing and 20% of nothing is still nothing. So what does it make a difference? The rabbi said, you'll get a blessing. Let's commit to 20%. She says, she says, she says they stood there and they said, we're accepting upon ourselves to give 20% of every penny we earn. As soon as they said that, they get a phone call. That phone call was the first rabbi they spoke to. The first rabbi says, where are you? He says, I'm home. He says, come over here right now. Come to the yeshiva immediately. He goes to the yeshiva, and the rabbi is standing there with another student from the years earlier who he had no idea who, who he was. He didn't know who this individual was. The rabbi says, here, Yaakov, meet Moshe. Moshe, meet Yaakov. You guys should do business together. He says, uh, what do you do? He says, I have a Judaica store in New York. He says, what do you do? He says, I'm a scribe. So he says, oh, he says, this is exact. He says, this is from heaven. He says, I, my biggest problem in my Judaica store in New York is that I don't have a scribe to provide me with scrolls. He says, I need tefillin. I need mezuzahs. I need sefer Torahs. I need megillahs. I need everything. He, sa- he says, Here's some, give him, gives him his whole batch, everything he has. He said to me, around my table, to my children, to my wife, he said it's been 22 years since that day that he got that promise from the rabbi. He's never had a single scroll in his drawer. I said, do you still give 20%? He says, every penny. (laughs) Every penny. It's an unbelievable blessing. It's an unbelievable promise. He said, and he's had, he said, he, he showed me his scrolls. I saw his scrolls. It's beautiful. I said, can I buy this? I want to buy, I want this mezuzah. And it's inexpensive. You know, typically, I have people all the time ask me, Rabbi, I need a mezuzah. No, how much is it? $60. So, oh, so expensive, <laughs> right? It's like, right, this guy's, this guy's mezuzah was $250. I mean, it's like the bent, it's like the Bentley of, 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 of handwriting. It is gorgeous. I saw it. I'm like, I'll pay you $250. I want this mezuzah on my front door. This is the mezuzah I want. He said, oh, oh, this mezuzah was sold two years ago. He's, I'm not kidding. He was going to deliver it to someone in San Antonio. That's why he came. He came to make his deliveries to all the people who, who buy from him. It's just unbelievable. Such an incredible story of how when you, you let go, you're at a point where you're just like, I don't know what to do anymore. Let Hashem, all he wants us to do is be generous like him. Put your hands in Hashem's hands. When you see other people, you be like Hashem. You be generous like Him. Take care of them. Not just like, here's what I'm going to give to get the guilt off my shoulder. And now go. Right? No, 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 no. Take it and take care of them in the best way possible. You know, and I have have two incredible stories I'm saving to a little bit further in the class. But, you know, the Talmud says a very important thing. The Talmud says that although a person is required to give 10%, you're required. That's, that's, that's a minimum. It's praiseworthy if you give 20%, but it would be neglectful to give more than 30%. The Talmud says don't, if you give more than 30%, you're 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 uh, a little bit too loose. You're a spendthrift, and you're you know you're spendthrift. Is that what it is? Right? You're giving too much, and you got to be very careful. But correct, correct. Now we see in the, we see in the Torah, we see that Moshe displayed generosity. God tells Moshe, place your hand on Joshua's head. And uh, and when he was uh, when he was giving him what we call smicha, which is ordination, when he was ordaining him as the leader of the Jewish people, so he was going to place. God says, "Place your hand on the head of Joshua." And what did Moshe do? Moshe placed both his hands. Sages tell us this is an indication of Moshe's generosity. All he had to do was place one hand, like God commanded him. No. He gave more than he was required to. He went beyond. 
it's an amazing thing. You know that we learn, our sages tell us that you learn generosity from the chicken, the rooster. Because when there's food, you know what they do? They start croaking. Cro- crowing? Cro- right? crowing? Crowing. Crowing. They start crowing. They start crowing. Why do they start crowing? Call all their friends. Come, there's food. Not just for me. Hide it just for me. No, no, no. You ever see the birds when they find a good find in the street? They find some roadkill, right? They, they start announcing to all the friends, guys, come, there's food. They're generous. They're generous. Not all for me. It's not all for me. And the more generous, I want to share with you my own story, my own personal embarrassing story. So when I was in yeshiva, I was 15 years old, and I started a Musr Vad. A Musr Vad is a small group of guys who want to grow, who want to, you know, and we, we got together every week, and each one of us took a week to discuss a certain topic. So my topic was generosity. I was far from generous. And I, I talked about it. I brought the sources of our, our rabbis, and I talked about it in front of them. And I'm sitting there saying to myself in the back of my head, I am the biggest hypocrite because here I am talking about g- generosity. Here I'm talking about being a giver, and I'm the furthest from being a giver. In what way? In what way? So I, when I, when I was at that age, when I was 15 years old, I didn't live at home. I lived in, in Jerusalem. I told my parents, uh, hasta la vista. And I said, I want to be next to my grandfather. I have no idea how many years my grandfather is still going to be alive. I want to be as close to him as possible. And I want to live in his house. And I want to learn in the yeshiva close to his house. And, and be immersed in, a, in, a, in an environment there. So my parents would send me every, while, every once in a while. They would send me treats from, from, from America. Now, it wasn't like today. Today, you go to Israel, you feel like you're in America because they have everything. You can find all the shampoos and soaps and, and all of the foods that you have here that are kosher. You can find there that are kosher. It's like it's, it's an open – import-export is, 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 uh, is very, very uh, plentiful uh, between New York and the, and the kosher market and Israel. It's like – so you're not really missing much today. But then it's like it was very, very different, very different cultures – of you know, so I had my snacks that my mother would send me, like you know my 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 goodies, and I I hid it in my locker, in my room, and I'd wait till it was quiet in the hallway. I'd go into my room, and I would open up my locker quietly, and I would take my snacks, and I would eat my stuff. I told you this is embarrassing. Don't laugh, okay? So and then I closed my locker, locked up my locker quickly, ate up my snacks, and I walked outside like nothing ever happened, right? And I, and there I was teaching about generosity, and I was thinking to myself, you know something, this is not right. This is not right. I want to be God-like. I want to emulate Hashem. So I made a new policy that whenever I want to enjoy my own snacks, I have to first offer two people. So I'd go into the hallway and I'd see two guys. I'm like, hey, guys, come here, come here. And they're like, whoa, what is this? Uh, you know, what is this guy when he's calling us? And I'd call them into my dorm room and I would say, come here, come here. And I open up my closet. And I'm like, please enjoy. Take something. Enjoy. This is from America. And the guy's eyes would open wide and be like, what? From America? What? We can have these treats. And they would enjoy them. And it changed. I'm telling you, it transformed who I was. It was very difficult at first. But at some point, it changed my very essence to the point where I couldn't take anything without offering someone else first. It became, it became such an ingrained trait. I, I can't enjoy something if I'm not sharing it with someone else. And I see today as a parent how much of a blessing that was that I had that experience. It's an amazing thing. It was embarrassing, an embarrassing story. But I think it was, for me, the greatest lesson on earth of what it means you need to challenge yourself. You need to put yourself, and if it's difficult for you, try it with something small. So this individual I was telling you before made this very large contribution to Torch. And he said he doesn't know where he's going to make the money to cover it, but he's doing it because he knows the organization needs it. And he's going to give this donation. He sends me a photograph about 10 days later with a letter showing me that his boss, the next day after he made that contribution, 
His boss walked into his office and said to him, we have a problem. And he's like, uh-oh, I'm getting fired. I just gave this big donation to Torch, and now I'm, I'm losing my job. The guy tells him, last year, the bonus we gave you, and he's, uh-oh, was too little. And it was dollar for dollar the amount that he gave to Torch. He showed me the check. Dollar for dollar. It came out of no place. It wasn't part of his what he was planning to get. It wasn't on his paperwork. It was out of clear blue. Exactly. It came from Hashem. It's Hashem is sitting there saying, Hashem, by the way, just so anybody should know, Hashem has no limited resources. Okay? Hashem's bank account has no limit. Okay? So, but Hashem is looking. Hashem is looking. He says, who's being generous with my children? Who's being generous? I'm ready to write a check. I'm ready to send you incredible blessing. Who's ready to do it? Hashem is going, let's go. I'm going to send it to you. Through, through places you have no idea where it's going to come from. I, I, I have so many stories I can share with you like this. But the point is not for us to see how we get paid back. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is for us to learn what it means to be generous and care about someone else and do it in, with a smile. Do it with a smile. So, that our sages tell us that when you need something, ask someone generous. Ask someone with a heart. Because they won't only please you with the actual material that you need, they will give it to you with a smile. Meaning it's not enough that someone just says, here, take your, take your donation and go. Don't call me again. Or someone who says, thank you for calling me. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for reaching out. Uh, you know, right now we're in the middle of our Torch campaign. right? You can go to givetorch.net and every dollar you donate is matched times three by our generous underwriters. Uh, you can go right after class, not during class. Please, not during class. Givetorch.net And I, I've been speaking to so many people today, yesterday, the day before, and we're putting together this whole campaign. This is one day a year where we raise our entire budget so that we continue. Even now, in the middle of the campaign, you can go to the, go to the site. You'll see people are donating where it's active. But we don't stop class. We don't stop class. 365 days a year we're teaching Torah. For one few days, we ask for everyone's help. The stories that I hear from people, people say, I got, I got a call this morning. He says to me, Rabbi, I don't know what I gave you last year, but whatever I gave you, I want to double it. I'm doubling it. He says, whatever it was, he says, I want to double it. I said to him, if you don't mind me asking, why? He says, because you're doubling your efforts. Why shouldn't I double mine? You're doubling your efforts. And we're tripling our efforts, by the way. Right? <laughs> uh, my goal this year in Torch, last year, we reached over a million people between the podcasts the videos, and the in-person and, and uh, Zoom audience, we reached over a million, 30,000 people last year. And we pushed that with the entire year. Baruch Hashem, with great, it's a great blessing. And this year, our goal is over 3 million. Our goal is over 3 million. And we're pushing hard. We're using every avenue possible, every resource possible to produce more, to reach more, to engage more, to market more so that we can reach more Jews and liven up their lives with Judaism, to, in, to infuse their lives with spirituality and holiness. So it's an amazing thing that when we pray in our Bikat HaMazan, I just looked it up right before uh, class, one of the things that we ask Hashem and we thank Hashem for is not only that Hashem sustains us, but Hashem does so b'chein. God does it with graciousness, with kindness, with a smile. Do you ever realize, I, and we've said this before, walk into the supermarket and you'll feel the love of Hashem. Because you could have walked into the supermarket and the apples and the bananas can all look the same. They'll all be a round ball that's white. No, instead they all have different textures. 
they all have different shapes. They all have different flavors. They all have different distinct smells. It's an unbelievable. It's God is every time you walk in, stop a second. Don't just look right away. Oh, I gotta get my list done, right? I gotta gotta shop my list. No, no, no. Stop a second. Take a moment. And look at the beautiful colors. Look at the beautiful colors. Take a deep smell. Say, Hashem, I love you. I love you. It's not, it's not just that Hashem gives us. He's so generous with us. He gives it to us in the nicest way possible. So that it not just be, here's your food, take it, go. No. It's with a kindness. It's with a generosity. In this week's Torah portion, we talk about the donations that were given to the temple. What does it say? Kol nidiv libo, whoever is generous in his heart. Why can't it just say kol nidiv, generous? No, no, no. Don't be just generous. Be generous with a heart. Be generous with a heart. It's different. And what do we see? An amazing thing. You have two different types of givers. Of the givers, you have the reluctant givers, and then you have the wanting givers. And and the the Torah tells us when it talks about the Nesim, the the leaders of the tribes, when it says their name, when it's written their name, it's written without the letter Yud. Why is it written without the letter Yud? Because Yud is referring to Hashem's name. And Hashem didn't want His name in their name. Why? Because they said, let everybody give their donations and whatever's left over, we'll do. Uh, 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 uh. We spoke about this a little bit when we spoke about alacrity, that they didn't rush to do it. They didn't, the, the generosity means I don't want to wait. Oh, I'll wait till later. I'll wait till later. No, I'm going to go right now. I'm going to do it right now. Those are those who gave. And it's an amazing thing. It doesn't say it, was, it wasn't an absolute requirement from everybody to give in the temple. No, no, no. God doesn't want you to give a guilt offering. He wants you to give a desirable offering. Meaning, something that you want to do. You want to be part of it. You want to be included in it. And it's an amazing thing. The promise comes in this week's Torah portion as well. You know what a palindrome is, right? A palindrome is a word like race car. You can read it both ways. Right? Dad. It's a palindrome. You can read it both ways. There's a word in this week's parsha, in the beginning of the Torah portion. It's vinat nu, and they gave. And it's vav nun taf nun vav. It's a palindrome. Our sages tell us, because when you give, you get. It comes right back. It's a boomerang. The more you give, the more you get back. You're opening up your uh, your your the the ability to receive when someone is giving with a heart Hashem says that heart is open I'm going to fill it there's different ways you know there's different ways that you can give you can pour from a cup and you can pour it into other cups or if someone is overflowing in their heart what happens what happens is God replenishes constantly and that overflows God says I want to be part of that I want to I want to overflow into your cup and then your cup runneth over. Right? You overflow. So I want to share with you two incredible stories. The first story is a story for, that's written in the Talmud. It's also written in the Midrash. I was my, it's an amazing an amazing we talk about coincidence there's no such thing as coincidence. It's divine divine Providence. Last night, I was putting my son to sleep. My sweet little Yitzi, he's eight years old, and one of our, our rituals that we have just about every evening that I'm not teaching a class uh, at his bedtime, I tell him a story. So sometimes I have great stories to share with him, and sometimes I have to open up a book to read a story. So yesterday, I opened up the book. What's the book? It's a story. It's a story book from the Talmud. Different stories from the Talmud. And this is the story that I read yesterday, randomly, on page 84, in volume 2 of Our Sages Showed the Way. 
which is stories from the Talmud. Most fascinating story. Rabbi Kiva, we all heard of Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Kiva was 40 years old when he discovered the Torah and he started learning. One of his primary rabbis was Rabbi Tarfon. Rabbi Tarfon was an unbelievable scholar and Rabbi Tarfon was an unbelievably wealthy person. Remarkably wealthy. Rabbi Kiva had unbelievable respect for his rabbi, Rabbi Tarfon. Wow. And he learned from him everything he could. He had one problem. Talmud says he had one problem with his rabbi. He felt that his rabbi was so wealthy, but he wasn't generous enough. He didn't know how to... How does he reprimand his rabbi? Like, how do I tell him, rabbi, you got to be more generous? See, he was in a little bit of a problem, a little bit of a pickle. What am I going to do? How am I going to inspire my rabbi to become more generous? So one day, Rabbi Kiva walks over to Rav Taf and he says, Rabbi, I have an investment opportunity. He says, there are some villages for sale. I want to buy the villages. It'll be a great investment. Airbnb. Airbnb. So... Rabbi Tarfon says, no problem. He takes, I think it was 400 gold coins, gives it to him immediately. And Rabbi Kiva takes the money and he goes to the study hall and he finds some scholars who are teaching children Torah and he gives them money. You know, these guys aren't paid a lot of money. I can tell you I'm in the teaching Torah business. We don't get paid a lot of money, right? So he, he, gives, them, he gives them money gives them out to all the teachers and to the rabbis. He gives them money. Okay, a few months later, Reb Tarfum says to Rabbi Kiva, he says, you remember that, that investment of all those villages? He says, tell me, how's, how's the investment doing? He says, boy, what an investment you've made. What an investment you've made. He says, do you want to see it? He says, yeah, I would love to see the investments. I want to see all those, those villages. So the rabbi takes him to the study hall. So he looks at him, he says, I thought you said there were villages. He says to a little boy, he says, come here, little boy, come here. He said, read me a verse that you're learning now. And he reads him a verse. He says, there's your village. There's your village. He says, all of these scholars you see here, these are your villages. He says, what are you talking about? He says, oh, you thought I would invest for you? Temporary villages? He says, I'm giving you permanent villages. I'm giving you villages that will last forever and ever and ever. Because when you invest in Torah scholars, you're investing in eternity. When you invest in this learning of Torah, you're investing in eternity. The Tarfam's eyes lit up. And he says, I owe you two thank yous. He says, the first thank you is that you reprimanded me so beautifully. He says, and the second is you taught me what it means to be generous. And from that day on, Reb Tarfun gave, enor- gave enormous sums of money to Reb Akiva to distribute to the scholars. He realized what is true investment. See, we all want an ROI. That's the bottom line. Return on investment. What's my return on in my investment? Do you know the greatest return on investment possible? The greatest, our sages tell us, the highest level of investment is investment in Torah. When one invests in Torah, it's the... Now, I want to tell you something. You want to know the highest investment in Torah? If I may say so myself, it's an investment in Torch. And I'll tell you why. Last year, we said we reached over a million people. That means every dollar that was donated to Torch helped us reach two people. Find me one. Do you know Do you know the, the, how much money people spent last night, how much the company spent on advertisements in the, in the Super Bowl? $6.5 million on the 30-second ad. I guarantee you we'll reach more people with less money at Torch. With 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 greater impact with greater impact the highest return on investment available on planet earth is right here in front of you i'm i'm not saying this sarcastically 
I'm not saying it in a, in a, in a joking way. I'm saying it, I'm honest with you. And each and every person who has donated to Torch is a partner in helping us reach the hopefully 3 million people that we're going to reach this year. See, one thing that I can tell you is that at Torch, we're investing 185% of our energies, maybe 200%. Right? We are all in all day, every day to teach Torah and to reach the masses. And the fact that we have people here on this call right now from all over the world, people here in this room who come in from far and wide, for what? To study Torah. Why? And it's an, and we, we are a non-denominational resource open to every single person who's interested in learning. We don't charge. There's no fee at the front door. If everyone come, take what you'd like. We're here to share your Torah with you. I want to leave off with one more incredible story. It's the story of Yasala, the holy miser. A guy comes into a, 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 a town in Europe, and outside the town is the, is the uh, cemetery, right at the edge of the, of the town. And right outside the cemetery, is, he sees there's a grave outside the cemetery. And it says on it, Here lies Yasala the holy miser. Here lies Yasala the holy miser. It doesn't understand what's going on. He goes into the town and he asks, what's going on here? Nobody knows. I, I, I don't know. They go to the rabbi. The rabbi says, let me tell you the story of Yasala the holy miser. He said, Yasala was such a wealthy man. He had unbelievable resources. The problem was is that nobody, nobody can get to him. Nobody successfully was able to fundraise from this guy. Everybody said, I'm going to try. And what they did was like this. They'd meet Yasala in synagogue, and they'd say, Yasala, can I meet with you? He said, sure. Come to my house. Be there today at 12 o'clock. The guy would come to, to Yasala's house, knock on his door, 12 o'clock. Yasala would open him in. Hey, how are you? What's going on? Bring him inside, and he would give him something to eat and give him something to drink, and he would, you know, talk to him. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your family. Tell me about what, what, what how can I help you? He'd say, you know, I, you know, I have some some uh, medical issues. I need your assistance. The medical issues, okay. What what are your medical issues? He would talk to him. What, how can you, how much money do you need? He said, these, these are my, you know, because of my limitations, I can't work a, a job, and I have four children, and I need money. He says, how much money do you need? They'd say, I need a uh, thousand uh, ruble, whatever it was, a hundred ruble. He's a hundred ruble every week, every every week. And suddenly he would turn into a rage. A rage. And you think that I'm going to give you this money? Get out of my house. Immediately you throw him out the door, slam the door shut. Don't ever come back here again. And then the next day, you know, people would, 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 uh, would say, no, how did it go? Terrible, terrible. He says, because you didn't know how to sell your story. I know how to sell my story. He says, okay, I'm telling you, it's not worth it. Don't mess with Yasala, the holy miser. Don't mess with him. And the guy would meet him in the synagogue again. He'd say, come to my house, come to my house at 3 o'clock. He'd come to, come to his house. And Yasala would do the exact same thing. The exact same situation. Every person who came, he would ask him, where do you live? I live here. How much money do you need? You tell him how much money he needs, and then he'd throw him out, out the door. Don't ever come back here again. Don't even think of coming back here again. You think I'm going to give you that kind of money? And this kept on happening with every single person came one day and Yasala the holy miser Yasala the miser was on his deathbed and the rabbis from the town knew how wealthy he was and they said they came to his bedside and they said Yasala the miser you better give us money for your own burial or we're not going to bury you we're not going to bury you we have expenses you've got to pay for this he says, <laughs> I'm not giving you money, right? I don't have money to give you. And they're like, this is crazy. This is we're warning you, if you don't give us money, we're not going to bury you. And he's, no, he's, he's, 
refusing to give them money for his own burial. You're like, this guy's unbelievable, such a miser. And he doesn't give money for his own burial. I mean, he's going to be a nuisance to the community. We're not going to bury you. I'm telling you, we're not going to bury you. Comes Monday, and he passes away. And they said, we're not going to bury you. We're not going to bury you. Tuesday, they left him. Wednesday, they left him. And then Wednesday morning, the rabbi gets a knock on his door. And the guy with that medical illness comes to the rabbi and says, I need money. He says, well, this is something new? He says, no, no, but uh, for years on Wednesday mornings, I would get an envelope under my door with uh, the money I needed to live for the week. The rabbi would give him. The next guy would come one after another. They're coming to the rabbi's house. Every single poor person in town is coming to the rabbi saying, I don't have any money, I don't have any money, I don't have any money. The rabbi realized that he was just playing an act. Yasala was just playing an act. They had already buried him. They buried him outside the cemetery. right? But they changed on his tombstone. Instead of calling him Yasala the miser, they called him Yasala the holy miser. Because they didn't realize how holy he was. Right. So now we have to understand that we talk about generosity. That that was his way of being generous. He would be generous with everyone. He didn't want anyone to suspect his greatness, his kindness, his generosity. He didn't want anyone to look at him and say, wow, this is Yassel the rich man. He wanted to live a life where people would say, look at this miser. He doesn't give anything. He's so stingy. And nobody knew that he was going every single Wednesday morning putting an envelope under his door and an envelope under each one of those poor people's door. You'd get all that information from them and then it, give it to them. And nobody realized that it was actually him. They thought it was the community charity. They thought it was the rabbis. They thought whoever it was. That's a, that's a whole new level. I don't know that any of us are on the level of uh, the Yassel or the Holy Miser. But to be generous, to go to remember, you have to remember this, is that Hashem wants us to be godlike. God is generous. God is generous with each and every one of us. Think of the resources that God gives us every single day. He doesn't ask us for any favors in return. He doesn't say, oh, if you don't do that for me, I'm not going to do it for you. Not, none of that. God doesn't even ask for a thank you. God doesn't say, oh, you didn't write me a thank you letter. Okay, don't come back for me next year for a gift, right? The God doesn't do that because the generosity is about being a giver. It's a reflection on the person who's giving. I need to give. I need to find the great, the greatest resource that I have available to give. So, it doesn't only apply, by the way, with money. It doesn't only apply with money. It also means giving in to others. The Chavetz Chaim writes about the importance of being a vatran, to be, to, to be someone who gives in. To be generous doesn't only mean that I'm willing to give money. Being generous with, but also being fear and honest. Being fear and honest in how we do business. Now, I remember I was once talking to a friend of mine and he said to me, I have two types of people I do business with. He said there are people who are generous in business and people who are stingy in business. So what do you mean? The contract is a contract. He says, yeah. He says, but there are people I do business with that when we're done the deal, they ask me, are you happy? Are you happy? If you're not happy, I'll give you more. And he's like, no, no, no. This is what we agreed. This is, this is fine. Right? But at least they show a willingness. You, they want to make sure that you're happy. That's called being generous. Even though they may not change one penny. It's exactly the way we agreed. You got your amount. I got my amount. They want to know that you're happy. He said, but then I have people that the way they approach the deal, when they close the deal, is like, this is mine. This is mine. That's for you. That's for you. That's your. That's yours, right? And and 
it, the the regard is not about what are you happy. Did you get what you think you you deserved? Is everything with it with a good eye with a with a with a pleasantness? It's rather this is mine. You take yours, and that's it. You know, and that's about you know we mentioned being a taker, being a giver. It's just the way you're getting the same amount, but it's is it with a kindness? Is it with a with a generosity? Generosity is in the quality of how you give, not in the quantity of how you give. In the quality, it's the love that goes with it. It also has to do with the quantity, but the way in which it's done is the most important part. But then there's another part of generosity. Is am I cautious about other people like I am for myself? Am I cautious about someone else's honor like I am for myself? Am I cautious for someone else's money like I am for myself? Oh, if it's someone else's, it's not a problem. I have no problem wasting it. But if it's mine, I don't want to waste anything. Right? That's also part of being generous, to be careful and be cautious. So, this is a very important trait. And it's a trait that we need to constantly strengthen ourselves to ensure that we're being generous. Almost, you know, I'll tell you, we have... I, Baruch Hashem, if I look today, I'll look at my status tonight uh, on my on my phone on, on the different uh, different apps, and I'm sure I'll have probably two, three, or four different organizations that are soliciting for different campaigns that they're running. And I my my policy is I give to everyone. I want to give to everyone because I I want to be a person who's always on the giving end of things. I I don't like asking. I never like asking. Even though I asked tonight and I said give torch.net maybe five or six times already, right? I don't like asking. I want to be a giver. I really want to be a giver. Now seven times. Yeah. Give torch.net. That's right. But, uh, but, but the idea is we want to be on the giving. I want to be on the giving end. I know that many times and it's uncomfortable. I'm on the, re- I'm on the receiving end. I don't want to be on the receiving. I want to be on the giving end. And that's why we ensure that in torch 300, oh, you're, you're amazing. Thank you so much. That 365 days a year we're giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And this is just, the campaign is not so that we make money. The campaign is that we can continue to give. So I implore upon each and every one of you, take the opportunity, give torch.net. Please be generous so that we can continue to do what we do every single day of the year. And this, this time next year, I'll come back again and I'll ask again. So that we not reach 3 million, so that we reach 10 million, God willing. Because our goal is from Houston, Texas, right over here, from this, this torch center, that we reach the entire world. That every single Jew feels proud to be a Jew. That every single Jew says, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm a torch Jew. I'm, I'm on fire. I'm proud. I'm, 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 igni- I'm, on, I'm lit. That's the goal. So, my dear friends, if there's any questions, please, you can unmute your microphones to our viewers. To our listeners on the podcast, thank you so much. I'll be turning off the recording now. Any questions that you have, you are welcome to unmute yourselves and ask anything about this topic or any other topic. If I know the answer, I promise you, I'll do my best to answer. Oh, such a great question. If there aren't takers, we wouldn't have an opportunity to give. Oh, oh, such a great question. Thank you. Thank you. I I would have felt awful later that I forgot this. Okay, so we have part of our prayer every day is the Ashrei. Ashrei Yoshrei Vesecha. And we know it goes in the alphabetical order. Aleph, Bet, each verse starts with the succeeding letter of the Aleph, Bet, except for the letter Nun. Nun, there's no letter Nun. You look, it goes Chaf, Lamid, Mem, no Nun, Samach, Ayin, Pei. What happened to Nun? Nun is not there. What happened? Our sages tell us that Hashem, what was the letter Nun? The letter Nun were for those who are impoverished. No flim. Those who are impoverished. Those who are poor. Before God created those who are poor, He created those who are going to support them. He created the Somech, the Samach. He created the Somech. Somech Hashem lechal ha no flim. No flim are those who are impoverished. Before Hashem creates the poor, He creates the wealthy person who's going to support Him. An amazing thing. There was a group 
of very wealthy people who met with a rabbi, a very prominent rabbi from Israel, came to visit, Rabbi Aaron Leib Steinman, of blessed memory. They came, and these, these very wealthy people, millionaires, came into a room with the rabbi, and they said to the rabbi, we think there are too many yeshivas. Every yeshiva is banging down our door. We need money, we need money, we need money. Enough yeshivas. How many yeshivas can come and ask us for another yeshiva, another yeshiva, another yeshiva? So the rabbi, in his, in his brilliance, looks at them and smiles at them. He says, perhaps there are too many millionaires. <laughs> right, who wants to give up being a millionaire? No, 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 not me, right? No. He says, the only reason you are the millionaires is because there are those yeshivas. You got it all wrong. You think they're taking away from you. No. They're not taking away from you. It's the only reason you have success is because you have them. It's, it's exactly the opposite. You will think, oh, if there weren't so many needy people, if there weren't so many needy people, you wouldn't have what you have. Hashem gives you what you have because there are so many needy people. It's exactly the opposite. And thank you for that fa- fabulous question. Thank you. Because so me Hashem lechal hanoflim. Before Hashem creates the needy people, he gives out the resources to the people who are going to support them. Because Hashem wants to. Because Hashem could have created a world without any poor people. Hashem could have created a world without any needs for institutions to be supported. Without any synagogues needing fundraisers. Hashem could have created a world where there wouldn't be any needs. But then what mitzvahs would we have for charity? What opportunities would we have to give? Hashem says, I'm going to make their opportunities so that you can share your resources. That's what I want you to do. Go out there and share your resources. Excellent question. Thank you. Yes. It, the truth is that there's been a, like an explosion in Houston of, of Jewish you know, vibrancy. And yes, I do agree. It's because of the Torah study. And I'm telling you, Yes, this is that, that, that wellspring that it all comes from. I mean, these, y- people don't understand. It's like we don't have a lot of overhead. I mean, our rent is minimal here. Our rent is minimal. And, we, and when people come here to visit in Houston, you're all welcome to join us here. Uh, visit us. Come see our operation. It's like you'll think like there are offices and there's staff. and there's, No, 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 no. It's like it's an office which is like three feet by three feet. And all of Torch operations come out of there. And we have a beautiful classroom here, a beautiful lounge next door. And that's it. It's very simple. It's like all we're here is learning and teaching Torah. That's it. It's no frills. We're just here to teach. It's like such a simple system. It's like I tell people when they join our board of directors at Torch, I tell them, you're going to be bored, like literally bored. Because we don't have all these committees and more committees and, and we got to keep everyone busy so we'll make more committees so that the committees can be busy with, with more committees. It's like, no, 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 no. We don't have, it's like, we're, we're very simple. We teach Torah and we need to pay our rabbis to teach Torah. That's it. That's it. it it's that simple, right? We don't have, you know, thank God. The reason we have a board is for oversight so that the rabbis don't, don't go crazy and do, do things that are not... Not with, but it's it, the purpose of what we do here is to connect Jews and Judaism. That's it. That's it. It's such a simple thing. We're not a synagogue. We're not a school. We have no membership fees. We want the doors to be open, and doors are open. We have people, Baruch Hashem, walking in every day. I had this is really cute. Um, this is the class that I was preparing, ready for the class on generosity. I, so today. Um, these three guys walk into this torch center today. It was at about one o'clock in the afternoon. And they say, I look at them and I look, where are you guys from? They're like, we're from Israel. We're here to sell the books or the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. I said, okay, great. Uh, I said, uh, how can I help you? They said, we're hungry. We don't have any money. We want to eat next door in the restaurant. Can you give us some money for lunch? So I said, yes. Generosity, right? Yes. I said, I'm going to do better. I'm not going to give you the money. I'm going to call the restaurant and I'm going to tell them that lunch is on me. I called the restaurant. I said, whatever they charge, let me know. I'm going to come in later on the day. I'll bring you my, my, my uh, card and I'll pay the bill. I, I want these guys, these young tzaddikim, young guys who are doing their great work. I want them to have lunch and I want to have that merit. Right? So it's not something typically that I'll do. Oh, sure, go to the restaurant. I'll cover it. But, but I, I felt like 
I needed to show generosity because many times Hashem sends us those people, instill this in ourselves all the time. In the introduction to the to the parsha of Kitavo, I believe it is, you should honor Hashem with your resources. Honor, right? Yechabed ha'adam mehono la'kadosh baruch hu. A person should honor Hashem with his resources, whatever his resources is. And then he says, and he brings a bunch of verses from King Solomon, from, from Proverbs. He says as follows, this introduction of Rabbeinu Bachya to the portion of Kitavo in Deuteronomy. He says, just know that whatever you're lacking when you give charity will be reimbursed to you. It will be taken care of. Even to know that, he says, he brings over here from the Talmud, that staka tatzil mimavis. You know what protects someone from death? Charity. That's the power of charity. It even can protect you from death. He says then something amazing. He says that we know something, that when someone comes to... You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcast.com.